I would like to offer what I currently know about Ihanzu, a Bantu language spoken in the Tanzanian Rift Valley. What I talk about is based on three months of, an of analysis of audiovisual data and, to my knowledge, represents the first discussion of the Ihanzu language. The most obvious first question is why Ihanzu? In a country like Tanzania of over 150 languages, why is it I am talking about Ihanzu as opposed to some other language? The simple answer is that among the 13 or so languages spoken in central Tanzania, an area where I have worked previously, Ihanzu is one of the most poorly described. Using the Boazian trilogy as a rough standard of how described a language is, and recognizing that a language is not fully described even with all three documentary outcomes are realized, as I mentioned uh, in a talk given several weeks ago, uh, we can see that the neighboring language, Iraq, possesses a grammar, a book of texts, and a dictionary. Similarly, Nyaturu, with a tone-marked grammar of some 250 pages, though not as well documented as Iraq, has some material with which linguists can learn how the language works and what it is like. Nyilamba also boasts a grammar and some texts in the form of a 10-page list of proverbs. Both are, unfortunately, unmarked for tone. Yukawa's 1989 vocabulary is tone-marked. Ihanzu, on the other hand, has no grammar, dictionary, or book of texts, and aside from some notes made in Todd Sanders' 2008 ethnography on Ihanzu rainmaking, there are no materials with which linguists can learn how the language works and what it is like. This represents a considerable gap in the empirical record for linguists interested in determining the relationships between similar languages, or linguists trying to understand patterns of contact and human history in the, in the Tanzanian Rift. In a broader sense, the, the lack of a holistic documentation also represents a missed opportunity to witness and record aspects of a unique culture, complete with its own traditions and practices, both linguistic, paralinguistic, and non-linguistic. Ihanzu's lack of documentation and description is therefore one way to answer why it is the language being addressed today. Before continuing, I would like to contextualize myself in relation to the topic at hand. Briefly put, I'm a linguist who is interested in the languages of the Tanzanian Rift, their documentation and description, their formal morphosyntax, and the histories and cultures of their speaker communities, especially as evinced through linguistic arts and language contact. I began working with Gorwa, a Cushitic language spoken in the area in uh, 2012, work that continues to present. Beginning in 2018, I started serious documentary work with Ihanzu, and in 2019 I will begin a project with which will incorporate work on these two languages, as well as Hadza, a language isolate whose speaker community borders on that of Ihanzu to the north. The data used in this talk has not yet been made publicly available, but all of my Ihanzu recordings will soon be made so online with the Endangered Languages Archive at SOAS, University of London. As such, each piece of data of phrasal length or longer has been marked with a unique identifying number which may be used to resolve back to the exact utterance in which it occurs. Again, because the deposit does not yet exist, I will use an existing one, my Gorwa deposit with Ilar, as an example. Therefore, we see here a phrase with an English translation below, and to its right, in square brackets, we see a unique identifying number, which helps us locate this data in the archive. One can see that the number is divided into two parts, an alpha numeric code to the left of the full stop, and a number to its right. The alpha numeric code corresponds to the recording in which the data is to be found. To access the recording, users can visit the, the deposit page and enter this alphanumeric code in the Search This Deposit box in the upper left-hand corner of the page. This will give access to recordings and analysis files. The number to the right of the full stop represents the utterance within the recording in which the data may be found. To locate the utterance, one can simply download the ALON file associated with the recording and go to the corresponding phrase segment, here the third tier from the bottom. The talk itself will be available for download at the DOI shown on the screen and also available to watch on my personal website. 
analysis of the Hanzu data is currently being carried out at the Research Institute for Languages and Cultures of Asia and Africa, the Tokyo University of Foreign Studies, and is funded by the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science. Geographically, Ihanzu is traditionally spoken in north-central Tanzania, the Simbiti River, seen on this map as corresponding roughly with the dashed line on the top left, forms a natural boundary to the north, and the sheer wall of the Nilamba Plateau to the west forms another. Aside from these two landforms, Ihanzu land extends south, blending subtly into Nilamba land, past Nduguti and toward the nearest urban center, Singida, and doing the same eastward with communities of Iraq, Datoga, and Yaturu speakers. To the north, on the shores of the Salt Lake Iasi, and extending south are communities of nomadic Hadza speakers, with whom the Ihanzu are in regular contact. In three dimensions, uh, courtesy of Google Maps, moving clockwise, with the community of Mkalama as a pivot, one can see a primarily flat land with the dormant volcano Anang rising in the far distance, quite a ways away from any Ihanzu-speaking communities. To the south is similarly flat, until in the southwest and west we begin to see the rift wall of the Nilamba Plateau. Finally, as we begin looking to the north, we can see the depression of the Yaeda Valley stretching to Lake Iasi, visible beneath the mountains on the horizon as a pale blue-brown stretch of water. The following is a short section of a recording made in July of 2018 in the Ihanzu town of Ibaga. Speakers are performing a task where they match photos of birds by describing them to each other. Moving on, no dedicated language survey has been conducted to determine the number of Ihanzu speakers, but as part of its work on the Language Atlas of Tanzania, the Languages of Tanzania project estimated that in 2009 there were 26,000 Ihanzu speakers in total. How robustly Ihanzu is being passed to children is another question about which not much is known. Personal observation, as well as testimony from speakers, both at the language workshop held in Babati in July of 2018, as well as in more informal settings, indicates that transmission in urban areas is very low, that both Swahili and Yilamba are increasingly being used in situations where, in the past, Ihanzu had been used, and that many speakers consider Ihanzu a language of the uneducated or the simple. The Hanzu have extensive oral accounts of a historical migration to their current homeland, some of which were recorded in amateur local historian Onesmo Dadi's account, and often these oral histories recall moving south, by or through Lake Victoria Nyanza. Sanders details multiple conflicts with European colonial administrations. The Hanzu are notable in the Tanzanian Rift in that they are sedentary farmers and see themselves unambiguously as such, as compared to other farming groups who prefer often to identify as pastoralists. Sorghum and maize are important staple crops. Kinship among the Hanzu is matrilineal, and residence is, at least in early marriage, matrilocal. Culturally, 
The Ihanzu are renowned throughout the Rift Valley area for their rainmaking abilities, an institutionalized practice which continues to this day. Modern religions, such as Christianity and Islam, have had less of an impact here than in other nearby areas, and where they exist, they are heavily influenced by and uh, exist in addition to traditional faith. The subclassification of Ihanzu is uncertain, specifically its place within what used to be called uh, Guthrie Group F30. The main contention lies with whether it is part of the Nyaturu Nyilamba subgrouping or that of Rangi Mbugwe. There even exists a claim, whose provenance is entirely unclear to me, that Ihanzu is a remnant of a Bantu group spoken in this region before F Group Bantu arrived. Rudimentary lexical comparison, though not by any means an infallible way to determine genetic affiliation, is a good place to start, and represents the richest sort of data currently available to me. Comparing Ihanzu with an F2 language like Nyamwezi and F3 languages like Rangi and Yaturu, it becomes quite clear that Ihanzu shares considerable similarities with F3, both uh, big and blood patterning neatly with Rangi and Nyaturu. Some forms are, however, less clear, such as the adjective black, which seems to pattern neither with Nyamwezi or Rangi Nyaturu, as well as small, whose relation to the Nyaturu form is distant at best, though we will return to this form in a moment. Leaving Nyamwezi as the odd one out, and bringing in exclusively F30 languages, a clear pattern emerges wherein Ihanzu consistently patterns with Nyaturu Nyilamba rather than Rangi and Bugwe. We can see this in the adjective for long, the noun for breasts, as well as the verb jump and the noun knee. With that said, let us not forget that language contact may also be playing a role here. Ihanzu is currently in contact with both Nyilamba, and, to a lesser extent, Nyaturu. According to Nurse and Philipson, what we may therefore be seeing in these lexical similarities is a much more recent and superficial series of borrowings rather than genuine shared genetic origin. Perhaps the best way forward is further lexical, lexical comparison, but also paired with a detailed look at morphosyntax as well. Furthermore, the history of language contact in the Rift Valley area must be viewed as one occurring over a long period indeed, and most likely featuring groups which were much more mobile and possibly more interdependent than they are today. Returning to the case of the lexical item for the adjective small in Ihanzu, I would like to submit that the relation is not one of borrowing or common provenance between Ihanzu and Yaturu, but one of borrowing between Ihanzu and Gorwa, Iraq, or, more likely, some common ancestor of both South Cushitic languages quite some time ago. One can see clear correspondences between all the words in this chart. However, the issue of origin language is not always entirely clear. For example, where it seems quite clear that the word for enemy is Ihanzu in origin, and therefore borrowed into South Cushitic from Bantu, the origin of the word for small is somewhat less certain. Is it a Bantu word borrowed into South Cushitic, or is it a South Cushitic word borrowed into Ihanzu? Is it a word borrowed into both uh, languages from a third language? Uh, remains to be determined. Moving from genetic and aerial considerations, the consonant inventory of Ihanzu can be characterized by its lack of labiodental dental fricatives, alveolar affricate ch, as well as rhotic ar. Conversely, the voiced affricate j, as well as the nasal consonant clusters m, d, ng, are all complex consonant phonemes in the language. Z is an allophone of the voiced alveolar fricative z, and the alveolar flap r is an allophone of the lateral l. In my working orthography, sounds are rendered by their IPA equivalents, save for the forms highlighted in red, which largely follow regional convention. Ihanzu has a seven-vowel system characteristic of other seven-vowel systems in Bantu, with the vowels laid out in the vowel space as shown. 
vowel length is phonemically distinct, with a distinction between long and short vowels. Ihanzu also has the semivowels or glides w and y. In my working orthography, most vowels are not represented by their IPA equivalents. Instead, I've opted for a system employed by scholars of Rangi, a language spoken in the area. Uh, see especially the work of uh, Oliver Stegen, 2011. Tonologically, Ihanzu features a distinction between high and low tone, or zero in a privative system, with the mora as the tone-bearing unit. Compare the minimal pair, ntundu, the gallbladder, and ntundu, a frog or toad. High tone can fall on seemingly any syllable in a noun, uh, the, as the example shown, except for the initial syllable. To this point, I have only observed a single high tone per noun stem. This pattern may, uh, however, be disproven as I become more proficient at hearing Ihanzu tone, or as I collect more nouns. Verb stems may bear high tone as well, but the patterns are more complex. Morphophonological operations in Ihanzu are a mix of those which are more or less familiar in other Bantu languages of the Rider region, as well as those which are less so. Predictably, we see homorganic nasal assimilation, in which a nasal consonant assumes the place features of the consonant following it. We also see cases of postnasal hardening, in which l hardens to d following a nasal. Less common is the palatalization of the sequence m, uh, the class prefix for noun classes 1 and 3, when followed by a front vowel, resulting in forms such as hueli, moon, and wana, child. Particular to Ihanzu in the region is intervocalic lenition. This typically results in a consonant becoming h between two vowels intervocalically, but it also may result in the consonant's total deletion, uh, as we can see in the second example especially if that consonant is close to an identical consonant. The operation is salient enough to be thought of as characteristic of Ihanzu. One can even see in the name for the language Ihanzu uh, has an H, where uh, in other languages that talk about this language, such as uh, Nyaturu and Nyilamba, uh, they say Isanzu. Morphotonological operations are also widespread and varied. My current understanding of the patterns allows me to confidently describe only one at present, that is the regular tonal shift of a high tone from one mora to the following mora. If a morpheme has a shifting tone, I write it following that morpheme. This table is a summary of noun class markers and their associated concord made with elements including adjectives and the connective ah. Note that there are gaps, some of which indicate a genuine lack of a morpheme, such as augments for the class markers 15 through 18, and others simply represent forms I have yet to see in the data thus far, such as most of the verbal object markers. I'm not strongly convinced at this point that class 12 is a noun class which has been integrated into Ihanzu for a long period of time, as certain forms I expected to be produced have, as of yet, not been. Observers will note the importance played by vowel height, for example, in distinguishing noun class prefixes 15 and 17, or subject markers for noun classes 9 and 10. Noun class semantics largely conform to regional patterns, humans in classes 1, 2, trees in classes 3, 4, for example, but several surprising cases exist in uh, clearly non-human nouns being assigned to classes 1, 2, including kutui, ear, zolo, razor, kapinkinya, dagger, and sakami, blood. My current knowledge of the verbal morphology of Ihanzu is somewhat less than that of nouns. What follows is a very rudimentary treatment in which I identify several common verbal morphemes, as well as their respective slots in the verbal template. As is to be expected, Ihanzu verbs are morphological complexes formed of a verb stem surrounded by a series of affixes. The form okumokua can be decomposed to a subject marker u a progressive aspect marker, ku, an object marker, mu, a stem, ku, and a final vowel, a. This can be placed in the template thus. 
the form ukimanyere functions in much the same way, but this time employs a morpheme that I'll provisionally call past or perfective, which fits into the second tense aspect mood slot rather than the first. The verbal extension morpheme, which I am most confident to name right now, is the passive wa, seen here in the form wale kwa. It fits into the template thus. Templatic morphology often appears to be obscured in Ihanzu by regular imbrication processes, seen here in the form gogilwe, in which the passive morpheme wa is expressed inside the past or perfective morpheme ile, resulting in the ending ilwe rather than the templatic wile. I currently have not looked enough uh, at data to say anything for certain about negation in Ihanzu, and therefore the negative slot will for now go undiscussed. Again, the majority of the data I've analyzed is lexical, and therefore I have far less phrases than words. With that said, uh, the one syntactic construction which I would like to talk about is uh, rather striking and uh, is represented in the way in which Ihanzu introduces relative clauses. So instead of employing relative markers inside the verb or relative auxiliaries, as in uh, Bantu language Swahili, for example, Ihanzu verbs are relativized by the addition of the morpheme N to the beginning of the verb. This is identified as a relativization strategy in both Nyilamba and Nyaturu, but not the other F3 languages Rangi and Mbugwe. In addition to relativizing verbs, the same morphology usually appears with adjectives as well, all of which I have translated as relative clauses. Does this mean that the N is somehow copular? I am doubtful as all copular forms I've recorded, recorded so far seem to agree with the subject for person, and uh, third-person copulas are null. This form has, in the earlier grammars of Nyilamba and Yaturu, been described in various ways, for example as the coordinating conjunction and, which takes a similar form. Given my current knowledge of the language, I will for now remain agnostic as to the ultimate origin of this form. What I would like to contribute, however, is that the South Cushitic language Gorwa also has a relativizing morpheme. This form is highly restricted uh, to the first person singular uh, of dependent clauses lacking an internal patient argument, uh, otherwise known as object relative clauses. But if we suspend our disbelief and also see that the form is otherwise unexplained uh, by using uh, regular rules of Gorwa um, morphology and uh, regular Gorwa morphemes, uh, perhaps this is a borrowing from this group of Bantu languages into South Cushitic. Finally, in addition to elicitation of words and phrases, as well as some recordings of conversations, I made a small number of recordings of Ihanzu's songs, one of which I will play as a small part of an example. <laughs> This song is characteristic of others I've encountered in the area, uh, in that it is call and response, and most likely best accompanied by a drum. In this particular recording, the leader is complaining about pain, and the follower is chanting in kankani, which was explained to me in graphic detail as meaning inguinal hernia. Typically, such songs use sickness as a metaphor for social disharmony or disrespect for one's elders, but in this case, I was told that this was simply a song about a hernia. In the coming years, documentation and description of Ihanzu is planned to continue as part of two principal projects, the currently funded one in Tokyo and uh, a further two-year project funded by the Endangered Languages Documentation Project based in Leiden, the Netherlands, with considerable periods of fieldwork in uh, the area in Tanzania. Within the current project, um, approximately two-thirds of all recordings are yet to be analyzed, most of which are elicited phrases about the morphosyntax of the language. 
The current project will also involve an international workshop of the theme Bantu in contact with non-Bantu, as well as a publication on a selected topic in Ihanzu grammar. The follow-on project builds on the current one, adding approximately 34 hours of structured elicitation and further documentation of natural language use by local native speakers who will be trained in audiovisual language documentation. Scheduled publications include those based on filling gaps and refining the aerial features identified in the work of KMN 2008, uh, as well as publication fo focused on providing further social context behind the Hanzu language, including more precise details on speaker numbers, language transmission, and Ihanzu culture. I'd like to end on why this work is important. First, it has been convincingly established by others that the F30 group is a geographical rather than a genetic or aerial grouping. But the successor or successors to F30 cannot be established until linguists have data on all of these languages. Documentation and description of Ihanzu helps provide further data on these languages, allowing for lexical and, eventually, morphosyntactic comparison. Key exercises if we are to tell a rigorous and compelling story about these Rift Valley Bantu languages. Second, Ihanzu data is essential not solely to Bantu studies, but to understanding the wider range of languages in the Tanzanian Rift Valley area. Even if one of the candidates for Voring I presented today proves to be valid, it would have consequences for how we imagine the past movements of people and interactions of languages and cultures across the Tanzanian Rift Valley, and ultimately enrich our understanding of the area and of its languages. In addition to these tentative borings between Ihanzu and South Cushitic, early evidence suggests contact with Hadza uh, are much more extensive, and of course, again, only detailed documentation and description can establish this. Finally, beyond the derived benefits of documenting and describing Ihanzu lies the real value, the, the privilege of engaging with a people and a culture to tell the story of a language on its own terms. The value of this, of course, is inestimable. Thank you for listening, and here are my references.